Thousands march in Brazil on Independence Day to mourn for their country. People in the Bahamas take stock of the devastation left behind by Hurricane Dorian. And Mexico's government touts advances made in curbing irregular migration to the United States. From the headquarters of Telesur English in Quito, Ecuador, this is From the South, and I'm Camila Escalante. Social organizations and student unions in Brazil held the annual Cry of the Excluded marches across the country on Saturday to commemorate Independence Day. But this year, the marches took a special meaning as demonstra demonstrators condemned the policies of far-right President Jair Bolsonaro. On Brazil's first Independence Day, under the rule of President Bolsonaro, he asked citizens to dress in green and yellow to commemorate the date, but thousands chose to dress in black and march on many cities. We are dressed in black because we are in mourning. We mourn for the Amazon, for the education system, for Brazil, and for our sovereignty. On Independence Day, we want to make it clear that Brazil is not free. We are not free under a president that licks the boots of the United States. We are not independent under that government that doesn't work for the people, but for the interests of other nations. The system does not work, was the slogan of this year's edition of the Cry of the Excluded March. Protesters also railed against the Valia Mining Company, which is responsible for two ecocides in Minas Gerais, against the wildfires in the Amazon and against massive budget cuts in the education system. We are living one of the most critical moments in the history of education in Brazil. Many public universities don't even know if they'll be able to open their doors next year. Scholarships are being slashed as well. As the government said, this year they will not support any. With an unemployment rate of 12%, neoliberal measures on social rights and public patrimony have raised great concerns. We need to remain on the streets fighting against Bolsonaro. We have to fight against both pension and labor reforms. We need to defend our sovereignty. We cannot accept that our patrimony is being sold off to foreign interests. The chants against Bolsonaro join together with their demand for Lula da Silva's freedom. We need to get Lula out of jail. He's a political prisoner who was jailed without any evidence providing he committed a crime. Sergio Moro is a thug. We are against the dismantling of so many ministers by Bolsonaro. We are ashamed of our rulers. The cry that excluded March took to the streets once again to face off against the government that pushes a nationalist rhetoric that defends the interests of agribusiness, multinational companies and of the United States. Still in Brazil, hundreds of citizens in Rio de Janeiro protested against orders by Mayor Marcelo Crivella to censor a book containing gay imagery during the Rio Book Biennial. The controversy began when a court annulled a previous ruling that allowed for the book to be displayed and sold, sending police officers to seize all copies. But organizers and participants of the event rejected this act, chanting no censorship. They managed to sell all 14,000 copies of the book in just a matter of minutes. Days after Hurricane Dorian tore through the Bahamas, residents are taking stock of the destruction left behind as the government finds ways to confront what has been referred to as unprecedented devastation. Video of Marsh Harbor in the Abaco Islands, the worst hit by the hurricane, shows widespread damage, with the harbor, workplaces, hospitals, and even the airport damaged or completely decimated. The official death toll rose to 43 on Friday, but is expected to increase as thousands remain missing. Meanwhile, hundreds of survivors are being evacuated by boat at Marsh Harbor. Speaking to the survivors, Prime Minister Hubert Minnis called for calm and promised them free transport. The evacuees will arrive in NASA to receive humanitarian aid and shelter.
We just want to get off the island. It's difficult for us. We can't leave. There is no water, no electricity. We are dying. We are dying. We should avoid this situation. It's catastrophic. Trinidad and Tobago has sent 100 troops from the Defense Force to the Bahamas. They'll stay there for 30 days to help with recovery efforts. National Security Minister Stuart Young briefed the troops, saying that they don't know what they'll face, but that the government of Trinidad will continue to send supplies to ensure the self-sufficiency of the Defense Force. Our focus is the Bahamas. The Cabinet of Trinidad and Tobago this week took a decision to send you, a hundred of our troops, up to assist with our CARICOM colleagues in the Bahamas. I have to tell you all that as a citizen of Trinidad and Tobago, I continue to be extremely proud of the Trinidad and Tobago Defense Force. Jamaican Prime Minister Andrew Holness also announced that 120 members of the Disaster Assistance Response Team from the Jamaica Defense Force had arrived in the Bahamas. The team was welcomed by the Bahamas Minister of National Security. A nation riveted, an island paradise left in ruins. A bird's eye view of the catastrophic damage after Hurricane Dorian hit Bahamas' Abaco Island. The center of the town, Marsh Harbor, looked like homes were put in a blender. As floodwaters rose, residents desperately tried to escape the deluge and save their lives. One family filmed their harrowing ordeal. I'm coming. Others remained in their homes waiting to be rescued. My island of Abaco is finished. Everything is gone. No banks, no stores, no nothing. It'll take at least four to five years to complete only my shop. I don't know how long it'll take for the rest of the island, but nothing is here. Nothing at all. Everything is gone. Just bodies. One family, as floodwaters crept into their house, prayed to be rescued. And we will be pray, remain safe in this place until we can be rescued, oh God. Father, we look to you, Father, for our help coming from you and from you alone, Father. For there is no one else for us but you at this moment, Father. The islands had endured more than a day of thrashing from Dorian before it made landfall on Abaco Island late on Sunday, September 1st. And then it stalled. It caused massive waves, torrential rains, and sustained winds. Rising floodwaters submerged several communities, homes, cars, consumed by floods. The Grand Bahama International Airport, unrecognizable, completely underwater. The runway, not even visible. The devastation left many in shock, including the Prime Minister, who addressed the public on Sunday evening, saying Thank the destruction is like nothing he's ever seen before. This is probably the most saddened and worst day of my life to address the Indian people. And um, I just want to say that as a physician, I've been trained to withstand many things, but never anything like this. By Monday, local news outlets in the Bahamas reported at least one death, an eight-year-old boy who drowned. Bahamians added their names of their relatives to an ever-growing list of hurricane victims to be accounted for. For others, emotions ran high as they were eventually reunited with loved ones. Some residents were not as fortunate. They still await word on their missing relatives. In just two days, after saying there were seven deaths, the Prime Minister confirmed the death toll had tripled. Meanwhile, relief supplies began arriving in the capital, Nassau. This while several countries pledged financial aid. Bahamas' fellow CARICOM member states also led the charge, holding talks with the Bahamian Prime Minister to determine what aid the 15-member grouping can offer in the aftermath of the hurricane. 
After nearly 48 hours of pounding the Bahamas, Dorian began crawling away from the island chain and moving up the east coast. Although it weakened to a Category 2 storm, it remained powerful as it tracked closer to the U.S. states of South and North Carolina. But Dorian left behind, no doubt, a trail of death and destruction in the tourist-dependent Bahamian islands, which is still counting the costs. Those who survived must now try to pick up the pieces. Recovery, no doubt, will be an uphill battle. Dorian, the worst storm to strike the island in its history, will surely haunt residents for many years to come. News from Venezuela and the latest from Sudan when we come back. Join us again in a minute. Welcome back. Mexico's government has presented a report on the advances being made to curb irregular migration to the United States. But authorities also stress the need for regional governments to support development in Central America as a long-term solution. From May to August of 2019, the flow of migrants traveling through Mexico to the United States have gone down by 56 percent. This was announced by the foreign minister who would travel to Washington, D.C. this week to review the results of the bilateral agreement made between both nations. I do not expect to see more threats to tariffs. We have reduced irregular migration by 56 percent in three months. What I plan on telling U.S. authorities is that our strategy has worked successfully. The foreign minister added that the bilateral talks have to provide the opportunity for Mexico to demand that the United States compare with their offer of investing funds in the southeast of Mexico and in countries of the Northern Triangle. Mexico is setting an example with Guatemala, Honduras and El Salvador by promoting investment and creating work for people in these countries. That is the best policy to fight irregular migration. 25,000 National Guard troops have been deployed in Mexico's north and southern borders and 357 criminal cases have been opened in relation to human trafficking, rescuing over 2,000 people so far who were being transported in cargo trucks. The law is being applied. The flow of migration has gone down. Human rights are being respected. Mexico is helping resolve the migration phenomenon by promoting development. Nonetheless, thousands of migrants continue to arrive in Mexico's southern border. This is why a long-term solution needs to be implemented. Negotiations need to be open to the public, to the media, to public opinion, so that we can reach an agreement that is not being imposed on us by the United States. At the U.S. border, the situation has not changed much, as hundreds of people are returned to Mexico every day in order to wait for their answer to their asylum request. These people join the thousands hoping to start their own asylum processes, with wait times stretching until March of 2020. Venezuela's Bolivarian National Armed Forces has dismantled an illegal fuel siphoning system. It was installed by paramilitary mafias in order to smuggle Venezuelan gas into neighboring Colombia. Two hoses were found in the border area of Tachita State covered in sand. Contraband has been a considerable problem and the government has taken aim at criminal groups engaged in hoarding and contraband involving not only gas but food and other goods. Resellers or bachaqueros making a living by buying key products at government regulated prices and markets and then sell them on the Colombian black market. President Nicolas Maduro says that elections for the country's National Assembly will be called soon. He made the announcement at a meeting between national officials and state governors. We have updated the plans. We have received a very complete report from the governor of Yaracuy regarding the preparation of the electoral machinery of the United Socialist Party of Venezuela and of the great patriotic poll and of the popular forces looking ahead to parliamentary elections of the National Assembly to be called very soon. I can say that right now, we are at the time of the highest level of organization of the electoral apparatus that we've seen in 20 years. 
I think that in the months to come, particularly in the first trimester of the coming year, we are going to be at the optimal point of the popular Bolivarian Chavist electoral machinery to go for the victory of the National Assembly. President Maduro also said that the government will not be sitting down at the Norway-accompanied dialogue table with opposition figure Juan Guaido, so long as he doesn't rectify his treasonous actions. The president's statements were made in response to a phone recording in which a U.S. State Department operative, Vanessa Newman, is heard instructing the opposition to drop its line on the cherished Essequibo territory. I now add to that protest the attempt of deputy opponent Guaido to give away the Esequibo. Until deputy Guaido rectifies his intention to hang over the Esequibo, we will not resume the dialogue table for dignity, for the sovereignty of our territory, inacceptable. Opposition lawmaker Juan Guaido and two of his collaborators are being investigated for high treason following the release of audio recordings that allegedly involve him in negotiations to renounce Venezuela's historical claim on the territory of Esequibo. These people want to throw away decades of work of Venezuelans who have fought for this cause, to reincorporate the Esequibo region to Venezuela, a region that historically belongs to us. The Esequibo region is rich in mineral resources. On top of this, just offshore, the region has the second largest high-quality oil reserve in the world. Therefore, the Esequibo is an area of great interest for foreign governments and transnational oil companies. If we review the declaration in regards to the Esequibo, we'll clearly see that the Exxon Mobil has been willing to finance all legal proceedings to make sure that Guyana takes over this region because they know just how rich in resources the Exequibo is. This investigation against Guaido is just the latest, as he's also being investigated for the misappropriation of Venezuela's resources held abroad. In August, it was discovered that one of his aides works for the Canadian mining company Cristalex, which won a case in the U.S. against Citgo to take over $1.2 billion in assets belonging to the Venezuelan people. This is an attack on Citgo's assets, using a principle to negate the idea of the corporate veil, which they call an alter ego. In law terms, this is when you consider person A the alter ego of person B. So Citgo is being treated as the alter ego of Venezuela, and therefore I can collect from Citgo what Venezuela owes me. And since Citgo is not within Venezuelan territory, I can simply take it over. This is a serious violation of international corporate law. Transnational mining and oil companies are constantly used in the plots against the Venezuelan government. There is a geopolitical plot that involves the U.S. economic blockade, but it all started with corporations that decided to strike back ever since our government nationalized many industries and assets. But as Guaido continues to rack up criminal investigations, he still celebrates economic sanctions imposed by the U.S. on Venezuela. Forces belonging to Libya's government of national accord have clashed with soldiers loyal to General Khalifa Haftar near Tripoli. Heavy and medium weapons were heard in different parts of the capital as fighting erupted beginning early on Sunday. The battle for Tripoli began back in April when Haftar's forces launched an attack against the GNA with hundreds killed in the months since. Sudan's first civilian-led cabinet since the ousting of President Omar al-Bashir has been sworn in, as the African country transitions to a civilian role. The 18-member cabinet, led by Prime Minister Abdallah Hamdok, took their oath at the presidential palace in Khartoum. This transitional government was formed as part of a three-year power-sharing deal signed last month between the military, civilian parties, and protest groups. And the corruption trial of former President Omar al-Bashir continues in Sudan. On Friday, his former manager testified that he had received more than $11 million to be used as bribes. Another witness, an accountant at a state university, testified that the institution's director and his deputy received $5 million in cash from Bashir. 
We'll take a short break now. Join us again after this. Welcome back. Protests continued this weekend in Hong Kong, despite the government scrapping of a controversial extradition bill in response to protesters' demands. On Sunday, thousands of people marched to the U.S. consulate building to call on U.S. President Donald Trump to liberate them. Marchers carried U.S. flags, sang the U.S. national anthem, and chanted pleas for Washington to step in. This, as the mainstream media continues to idolize protest leaders as supposedly demonstrating for democratic values, despite evidence of external influence and funding for riots. Soon after their march to the U.S. consulate, the same protesters trashed a central mass transit railway station located nearby. They smashed glass panels and windows and covered the area with graffiti. This is the latest attack on a public facility by protesters, as they have previously destroyed numerous stations and infrastructure, even taking over the Hong Kong airport, attacking tourists, and holding a journalist hostage. A powerful typhoon has caused significant travel disruption in Tokyo, Japan's metropolitan area. Typhoon Fashai made landfall before 5 a.m. local time in Chiba, forcing airplanes to cancel an airlines to cancel a number of flights and some major roads to be closed. Authorities have also issued a non-compulsory evacuation warning in some parts as forecasters caution that the rain and wind could be destructive. Malawi held its first beauty, con beauty pageant for people with albinism as a way of encouraging them to participate in public life. Malawians born with albinism have long lived at risk of being abducted or killed, as some people believe their bodies contain magical powers. Many also face discrimination and are abandoned by their families as they are thought to be cursed. In 2019 alone, 10 murders, 15 disappearances, and 95 cases of attempted abductions of albino citizens have been reported. Very, very excited. I didn't really expect to be the first ever Miss Albinism in Malawi. Um, what I'm going to do now, firstly, um, is to bring awareness to communities, especially the local communities that have that hold negative attitudes, um, myths, and misconceptions about persons with albinism. We've come to the end of this news brief. You can find these and many other stories on our website at tellusourenglish.net. And join us on social media, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. For Tell Us Your English, I'm Camilla Scalante. Thanks for watching.